In the mountains of western Japan, the residents of these greenhouses are waiting for summer temperatures of 35 degrees or higher. That's for some the time for mating. This is the Japanese koi carp, a fish that is worldwide admired among collectors and enthusiasts. But why? What makes this colored carp so special? In this video I take you to this remote area in Japan where the origin of the carp comes from. A documentary that gives you an insight into a unique world that is unknown to many people. Last year I traveled to Japan to find out why these fish are so extremely valuable and unique. I delved into the history of the Japanese koi carp and witnessed for the first time a special breeding process that until now took place behind closed doors. This year I return, a year after quitting my job, to find out how other breeders secure their entire annual income and future during one of the most exciting times of the year, breeding the Japanese koi. My name is Ivo and I'm 34 years old. Since 2014 I've been traveling to this special area in Japan where I find my passion and love for this Japanese fish. I record all my adventures in these documentaries. During this trip one of my dreams come true, attending the breeding of this special and mysterious fish in Japan. Travel with me and experience how Japanese culture, friendship and love for these living works of arts came to be. The Japanese koi is one of the most valuable fish and is also called living art or swimming jewels. The Japanese koi represents love and friendship and is popular with collectors worldwide. The history of the Japanese koi goes back a long way and started with the black carp in Asia that was called magoi by the Japanese. What started 200 years ago in a mountain area in western Japan as a food source during the harsh winters rice farmers discovered that the fish changed color, resulting in the creation of the Japanese koi, also called Nishikigoi. One of the most legendary koi is Hanako, which means flower child in Japanese. The myth says that Hanako lived to be 225 years old, the oldest koi fish in the world. Nowadays, the average of the Japanese koi is between 40 and 50 years old. I'm traveling to Japan, to Yamakoshi to be precise. A small mountain village where they are great at one thing, breeding Japanese koi. It is June and my journey starts in the Netherlands. The journey from Amsterdam to Nagaoka in Niigata prefecture will take approximately 20 hours. A 13 hour flight and a 3 hour train journey from the airport to Tokyo and then on the Shinkansen, also known as the super fast bullet train. It feels like coming home. The peace and structure in this country is so unique and nowhere else in the world I have experienced this so pleasantly. Today I have an appointment at Terrazzo Koi Farm. A koi breeder known for breeding a white and red fish called Kohaku. I want to find out more about the oldest koi in the world, Hanako, and decide to look for some old koi. 
especially fish that are used to breed based on successful genetics. I'm lucky today. The parent koi are still swimming in the indoor ponds. Accompanied by his daughter, Yuki Kawakami, and his granddaughter Koto, Chussie searches for his oldest fish in his ponds. What strikes me is that the fish looks different from the koi that I normally see. I wonder if I've seen a fish older than me before. I'm curious why the breeder chose this fish to breed and how old the fish is. Probably uh, 34, 34 something. I bought, uh, when I bought a uh, fish was uh, three or four years old, yeah. Still on a very nice belly, uh, good body. Shoshi explains that he uses this fish for breeding because the structure of the koi is very good. But also the beni, that means red in Japanese. The red pattern that you find on the fish he breeds. I'm curious why he's still attached to the fish that are almost 40 years old. No reason, uh, yeah, because uh, uh, it was a very important uh, male for me. Uh. The breeder wants to take me to one of his outdoor ponds, also called a mud pond. These are so called because of the high concentration of clay, minerals and vitamins in the soil. But before we drive into the mountains, Shoshi wants to show me something. I soon realize what it is, his holy grail, a small book which he has documented all his parent koi's over the past decades. Yeah, this is that male, still been here, he already It's time to feed the koi. The fish swim in these outdoor ponds during the spring, summer and autumn. The combination of climate, proper nutrition and care allows the fish to grow best here. During the autumn in October, the fish are harvested and brought in. They can stay here or they will be sold. Feeding the koi is done every day. The mud ponds are also checked daily for another animal, the bear. We leave the mountains temporarily and I travel to Ojia, which is located in a valley. Last year I visited one of the largest koi farms in Niigata, the Danichi koi farm. Shigeru Mano, the owner of this farm, is one of the best koi breeders in Japan and know how to win the biggest prizes with his fish. Today, something special and unique awaits me. Shigeru invited me to come and see some of his fish including one very special fish. Mm -hmm. 
many people who hear of the Japanese koi for the first time. They will often say that the fish with the red dot on the head is the most valuable. But that's actually not true. But it is an association for people with Japan because of the red dot is also incorporated in the Japanese flag. Yes, this fish is very special. Shigeru is happy to tell you more about it. This fish is also called Tansho. Yeah, you know, this is Tansho. This is a uh, five years old, I don't know, size, maybe 80 something right now. You know, this is a really huge body. Not every Tansho become like that. You know, this is one of the special body. You know, five years, six years. We have a bunch of so many koi, you know, but uh, every year we have to select, select them. The really top, top, top koi, is, you know, very small numbers. Those are one of the top levels. And, uh, you know, since it's a breeding, you know, fries, you know, we have uh, so many fries every day, you know, like a summertime, 100 day, every day we have to select, you know, you know, pouring every day. Then become like uh, about 90, more than 95% gone. The only little pieces, you know, numbers to grow, you know, this side, the sun side. You know, we have maintenance, we have so many houses and so many concrete ponds. You know, fried, we have a more than 200 map bones for fried. And after two years, I don't know, 100, 100 something. So, so many map bones we have it. Every day we have to go check and, uh, you know. So, of course, the food we have to test a lot and uh, so many things to do. Then, five years, maybe good level, sorry. 30 pieces, four years, 40 pieces, then every year kind of slow, slow, slow. Then only one top level, that's very, very rare. It takes a lot of effort to select the best fish. Shigeru has already won the world championship several times with his top koi. I realize that it's also a numbers game. The greater the number of offspring, the greater the chance of having a real top koi. While Shigeru is inspecting some of his fish, I am picked up by one of his chief staff members. I am allowed to release one of those special fish into the pond in the mountains. This is the 2020 world champion. An invaluable fish for its qualities, such as its skin quality and size. A fish with which the Dainichi Koi Farm hopes to produce many offspring in the future that have the same genetics. This is important to secure the future of the farm. I have now arrived at one of the other koi houses, where I watch carefully how the staff prepares the fish for the transport into the mountains. In convoy and filled with thousand liters of water, we drive from the farm towards the mountains. A short 10 minute drive. In a few moments, the fish will be released into the outdoor ponds, where they can enjoy their well-deserved rest. In this mud pond, the fish can grow and look for natural food. The employees of the Danichi Koi Farm carry out this operation with military precision.
by adding water from the pond, the fish can get used to any temperature difference in the water. This causes the fish to experience less stress. It is time to release the big fish, including the 2020 world champion. You have to give something to be part of this special moment. While filming, I discover that my suit is leaking. The result is soaking wet legs and socks. It's the next day. After a good night's sleep, I start the day with a short lunch at the invitation of Omo-san, breeder of the NND koi farm. The food in Japan is amazing, wherever you go. I am passing through to a place of interest, a gigantic red and white temple that you can see from miles in the mountains. I'm curious and want to take a look before I continue my search for a breeder who will allow me to film their breeding process. I'm very impressed with the size of this building. From the air, but also when walking, I feel very small. Everything is so beautiful. Last June, I quit my job as a police officer and decided to seek my future and happiness in my greatest passion, the Japanese koi. I was told that this shrine is not very old and it will bring you luck, wealth and prosperity if you visit it. I decide to go inside to make a donation and to learn more about this temple. Out of respect, I decide to leave the camera at the entrance. I have arrived at Isa Koi Farm. Isa Koi Farm was founded in 1970 and enjoys worldwide fame for its highly regarded Showa, a black fish with red and white patterns. A major setback was the earthquake in 2004. Isa Koi Farm was severely affected. Many fish, including their parent stock, were lost. The farm has now been fully restored and is running at full capacity. It is busy today. I try not to disturb, but I feel that I'm welcome, and I decide to watch the selection of the baby koi that are only a few days old. Only the black fish advance to the next selection round. Last year I was welcomed for the first time to the harvest by Mitsunori Isa, the boss of the koi farm. An amazing experience, and this year I hope to be able to attend something else, breeding the koi. I decide to walk around the farm before talking to Mitsunori. I take a look at the one-year-old koi and I take a look at the bird chambers, a room that normally remains closed to visitors. It's early. Late last night, I finally got the answer I was waiting for. I'm allowed to be present at the breeding of the Japanese koi. At 5 to 5, I receive a message that I can come to the Isa koi farm. While the streets are quiet and many Japanese are still sleeping, there is someone who stayed up all night to monitoring his koi. Today, we are witnessing a special event, an exclusive look behind the scenes of the Isa Koi farm. 
The well-being of the fish is most important. The breeder ensures that the koi experience as little stress as possible during the collection of the eggs and sperm. Never before has the Isa Koi farm allowed anyone to film this event. I'm nervous, but also excited. I hope everything goes well and I'm not in the way. While I still can, I try to ask as many questions as possible. After hours of waiting, something happens. I see that Mitsunari reacts alertly and takes the time to look at the fish. There are women and men in this pond. The moment the breeding is waiting for is the moment when the females become more active and start releasing their first eggs. He uses a flashlight to see whether the yellow colored eggs float in the water. Just wait a little longer. One of the females has only released a few eggs. As in nature, the males chase after the females. The tension builds, and Mitsunori and one of his staff members prepare for the moment. After being chased by the male fish all night, they are now getting some rest. All the fish that the breeder has selected have something unique in their DNA. Something the breeder would like to see in a new generation of koi. Everything is done sterilely to prevent the eggs from becoming infected or damaged. All fish experience no pain. The fish are separated and given a sedative. This makes the fish calm and does not notice the harvesting of the eggs. The staff member keeps a close eye on breathing. When the fish is asleep, it is time to harvest the female eggs. The fish is rinsed clean with sterilized water. It is clearly visible that the female is ready to release her eggs. After drying the fish, the koi are wrapped in soft towels that keep any form of moisture away from the eggs. Some females can produce between 1 and 2 kilograms of eggs.
it is important that the fish recover quickly, which means that the breeder must be sure that all eggs have been removed from the koi. The fish is then given an antibiotic injection, so it doesn't become ill after this physical activity. The result is astonishing. No less than 1.3 kilos of eggs. Tens of thousands of koi will be hatched from these eggs after fertilization. After receiving the antibiotic shot, the fish is allowed to rest and recover. It's the male's turn. The males experience less stress than the females and only need to be calmed down slightly. The males are often selected based on their deep colors and skin quality. These are often better than those of the females. Strangely enough, female fish are more popular with collectors. Partly because the males remain relatively small compared to the females, which sometimes grow larger than one meter in size. Once again the fish is dried and it's time to collect the sperm from the male koi. This is simply sucked out with the pipette. It won't be long before the male can return to one of the indoor ponds. It takes a while before a Mitsunori has the right quantities. It remains a matter of luck. It sometimes happens that parent animals are not ready for spawning and skip a year. Now that everything has been collected, the breeder can get started with his calculator. Mixing must be done very carefully, because without the correct ratio, fertilization can fail. The fertilized eggs are distributed over the brushes. These brushes have small hairs to which the eggs stick immediately. It's crazy that in three days, these eggs will hatch and there will be probably a potential champion among them. I am grateful that I can experience this, this early morning. I notice how concentrated the breeder is. But I'm about to leave. Well, Mitsunori repeats this process with a new set of parents, I prepare for my next appointment. Because what happens after those three days? It's time to find out. I travel back into the mountains. This is Yamakoshi Mushigame, the mecca for collectors. It is one of the enchanted areas of western Japan where everything revolves around the Japanese koi. In my journey in search of answers, I return to the Shintaro koi farm. For some of you, this is a well-known place where I was able to be present at night during the cultivation last year. I'm now going back to find out what happens in the days after the eggs hatch. This is Kosuke Saito, the son of Masaru Saito, and together with his brother Kensuke, they run the Shintaro Koi farm. Last year, Kosuke led the cultivation together with his brother. Today, 
I can help select the newborn offspring. While the morning sun is already burning brightly, the people who come to help today gather outside. Under the watchful eye of father, Kosuke prepares everything. Chairs, water, extraction and shade. Everything has been thought of. Masaru-san comes to see how things are going. He is satisfied. Today, Kensuke asked for help from his wife, best friend and his wife. Today we will select as many fish as possible with six people. Kensuke explains which color fish should be sucked up through the small tube. This causes the water and the fish to go to the large container with water and oxygen. We start the selection with good courage. As strange as it sounds, this work calms me down. It is relaxing and there is plenty of time to chat and think about everything that I've seen these days. It is very hot, but we continue to work hard. One by one we can take a break. I am well taken care of, there is plenty of cold drinks. I try to stay focused and separate the black fish from the yellow ones. Only the black fish will soon have beautiful wet and ripe patterns. After two hours of selection, we are done with the first batch. I realize how much more we have to go. I walk with Kosuke to the big koi house, where all the fish swim that are ready to be picked out. A bucket contains thousands of small fish. It is almost unbelievable how many there are in total. We carefully walk back to the main house. Kosuke has one important job. Not to drop the bucket. After an hour of work Masato comes downstairs. Lunch. We've earned that. <laughs> Masaru's wife makes one of the tastiest curries. You would have to travel to Japan for this alone. Made with the best rice in the world, which comes from Niigata. Everyone takes a moment to rest. Especially Kosuka, who closes his eyes for a moment. It's time for the next step. Just before sunset, I receive a call from the Shintaro Koi farm. After a long day of selection, it is time for the next step in the process. Releasing the offspring that are only a few days old. These are the so-called fry ponds. Masaru and Kosuke drive to the mud ponds with all caution. It is quite a crazy idea that a few day old fish 
as vulnerable as they are, are already going into the mud pond. Here, they will be given natural food and adapted powdered food. With the right nutrients, these koi will grow quickly from a few millimeters to a few centimeters in just a couple of weeks. This means that the breeder can continue with the next selection in just a few weeks. But you will see that at the end of this video. I have another important question. What happens to the koi that aren't good enough? Before I go back into the mountains, to a place where I was not welcome before, I drive past my favorite shop to buy some koi souvenirs. I am always welcomed here with open arms and the owner always addresses me by first name. If you ever go to Ojiya in Japan, stop by her store. Her shop is next to the train station. I would really appreciate it if we could support her by buying something. Another drink from the koi machine and it's time to go back into the mountains. I am driving to a place I've rarely been to. A place that is normally only accessible to Japanese hobbyist breeders and hobbyists. Today, I am at the local koi auction. Fish are auctioned here once a week on Friday. Koi that are not sold or intended for the domestic market are brought to this place. This way the fish ends up in a good place. It is special to see how they work together here, sorting the koi and then auctioning them. The fish go by crate through the auction house, where a new owner makes a bid for them. This trip has given me many wonderful memories and answers to my questions. In the coming period, the breeders will select their fish for 100 days until the best koi remain. Selecting these koi is hard work during the very hot summer months in Japan. I come to the conclusion that these fish are true works of arts, bred and judged by humans. A unique fish that involves a lot of physical work and a risk for the breeders. Knowledge and experience passed down from generation to generation to protect and pass on their unique world. Making this documentary takes a lot of time. I would appreciate it if you would leave a comment. Would you like to see more of my documentaries? Then take a look at this one. Thanks for watching and I see you in October where the breeders are looking forward to harvesting their big fish. Will I see you there?